Okay. Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to uh, everybody present in the room this evening, and an equally warm welcome to those that are watching on our live YouTube channel. So, my name is Councillor Steve Tuckwell, and I am the chairman of this evening's major applications committee meeting. So, before we get into the applications themselves, we've got a few housekeeping uh, things to sort of take care of. The first one being um, that could I ask that mobile phones are switched either off or to silent? That would be good. We don't want to sort of disrupt this evening's proceedings. Um, in the event of a fire evacuation or an emergency alarm being uh, sounded, there is a fire exit over there at the door that you came in, and there's a fire exit uh, directly behind us as well. So I could ask that you make your way calmly. Officers will guide you to the assembly point, which is at the front of the building. We also have uh, feedback forms um, for people, so you'll see probably on your chairs um, some bright orange feedback forms. We encourage feedback um, all the time. We want to be making sure these meetings are looked at to see if we can make them flow better, um, so that would be good. And for those people that are watching on YouTube, beneath the broadcast there is a link to, um, to the Council's website where you can leave feedback online. So any feedback is always grateful. So. That's the housekeeping. Uh, in terms of introductions, <coughs> that okay? It's my it's my hoarse voice this evening with a bit of a hang, bit of a cold coming or just going. Um, so we're going to do some introductions. Um, so I'm going to firstly introduce tonight's voting members of the committee. So I'm going to start on my left with Councillor Birra, Councillor Morse, and Councillor Duncan. And then on my right we have Councillor Higgins. Councillor Hagger, Councillor Melvin, Councillor Morgan and Councillor Goddard. So those are the voting members this evening. Um, in the event, I won't be voting, but in the event of a tie um, between, uh, for and against, I will be casting a vote. I'm also joined this evening by a number of Hillingdon Borough's officers around the table. The officers' role this evening is to give us technical advice on the matters that are brought before us this evening. And I'd like to start with the gentleman on my right here is James Roger, Head of Planning. We have Mandit Maholtra, who's our Major Applications Manager. She'll be presenting this evening's applications. Mandit is supported by Alan Tilly, who is our Transport Planning and Development Manager. He'll be advising us on any highways matters and transport matters this evening. On my left here, I have uh, Anisha Teji from Democratic Services, who's uh, keeping me in check this evening. And we also have Gary Egan, who's uh, from our legal service department. Glen Egan, sorry. Glen Egan, this evening. So, now we've got a few other things to sort of get through before we can actually get into the main body of uh, the agenda. And I think the first thing is to start with apologies for absence this evening. Apologies received from Councillor Lavery with Councillor Haggart substituting. Apologies received from Councillor Oswell with Councillor Beerer substituted. <laughs> Okay, and uh, thank you to those councillors that are substituting this evening, it's much appreciated. Um, we go to agenda item two, which is declarations of interest in matters coming before this evening. So I'm going to start with a declaration in item number eight. Uh, it's a non-petition item, but I'm going to be declaring an interest in, in that item. Um, so I will be leaving the room at that point. To help matters along, uh, item eight, we're going to schedule to the end of the meeting so we don't interrupt the flow of, of the meeting. So I will be leaving the room for agenda item eight when it's done at the end. Any other declarations? It's extremely unusual, this, and it's the first time I've done it in 10 years, <laughs> but uh, um, because I am effectively the corporate project sponsor of the Cranford Park HLF project, I will be leaving the room during items nine and 10, and uh, um, Mandit will deal with those. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you for that, James. And just to mention on, on the, the point that I'm leaving the room, um, Anisha will be guiding uh, the committee through how that works. So that's good. That's good. So, okay. Um, next item on the agenda is to sign and receive the minutes of the previous meetings. Now, there was two meetings. There was a meeting held at the end of the council meeting on the 16th of January. Um, so can I take those as agreed? Okay, and then the next item uh, of minutes was the major applications committee, which was held on the 22nd of January. So can I take those? Great. Okay, right. Thank you for that, everybody. Moving back to 
Just to confirm, um, there's been no matters notified in advance or urgent uh, this evening, so we'll be taking the agenda as it's published, with the exception of item 8, which we now know will be moved to the end of the agenda. Um, in terms of item 5 on the agenda, just to confirm, there are everything is in part 1 this evening. There are no matters which are discussed in part 2. Part 2 is normally reserved for matters that are dus discussed in private, and there is no matters in part 2 this evening, so everything is in public this evening. So that concludes pretty much all of the housekeeping, the introductions, and the little bit of business we have to do before we get into the applications themselves. So that brings us nicely to agenda item 6, which is a petition item. Um, and we will start with Mandip's presentation. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Agenda item 6 is Little Britain Lake on Packet Boat Lane in Cowley. The application has been before planning committee before, um, so you may or may not recall this. It was on the 2nd of August in 2017. The major applications planning committee at the time deferred the application in order to get um, an ecological report prepared. We have now received the ecological report. It has been reviewed. The application has been reconsulted on and is before us with a recommendation for approval. So I'll just recap on the proposals. So the application is for a proposed footbridge over the River Colne at the northern end of Little Britain Lake. So that's the land outlined in red on the location plan on the screen. The application site is wholly within the green belt, um, and this it denotes the land ownership. So the red is the land for the application site, blue denotes other land within the ownership of the applicant. So this is the existing site plan. We can see the River Colne running north to south with a weir to the north, which is served by via Huntsmoor Weir, um, which is located off Old Mill Lane. The proposed site plan indicates the location of the footbridge, which will lead from one end of, well, be accessed via Old Mill Lane and will lead you lead pedestrians only across Little Britain, um, across onto Little Britain Island. This is a image of the um, the footbridge itself. So it is it has been constructed to be as small as possible and is only for pedestrians. Um, some context views of the footbridge. So the application site, um, as shown in the aerial, there are significant uh, trees around the Greenbelt location, and these are just some photos of the site showing the sighting of the proposed footbridge over the River Colne um, from the northwest corner of Little Britain Lake over to the island. Um, so we do have some great annotations on the top if you can read them just here. So this is the sighting of the proposed bridge looking north via the Huntsmore tilting weir. Um, apologies, so we don't have a lot of we don't have any photos from the other side because there is no access. So the application before us, just for reminder, is to provide access onto Little Britain Island in order to maintain um, maintain and also to get onto the island. At the moment there is no access, so primarily the footbridge will provide access. The Environment Agency are supportive of the application because at the moment they cannot carry out or have indicated to us that they cannot carry out maintenance because they cannot access Little Britain Island. Um, you obviously had significant concerns with regard to the ecological impact of building a footbridge from one side of the site over onto the island. Uh, the ecological report did identify um, some need for mitigation by virtue of bat boxes, bird boxes. So if you check your addendum, uh, the published report did not have a specific condition requiring the biodiversity enhancements of the report, although it is required by virtue of condition number... Condition number three, condition number four. However, what we wanted to do was just to make sure that um, it was set out somewhere quite clearly that the ecological mitigation and enhancement plan, which was submitted in November 2019, is fully implemented and complied with, um, and also the mitigation that's proposed therein. There are some other minor um, addendum changes. We also have set out in full a local ward councillor's um, comments. They're unable to be here at planning committee today, but we have set them out in full. We have also received an additional petition since publication of the planning committee report um, and five additional neighbour letters. Now, having reviewed the petition and the objection letters, we do consider most of the comments have been addressed through the officer report, so they have not been... Um, 
repeated. One new response does, however, um, warrant a specific mention, and they specifically raise a concern that once the bridge is built, the island would be developed for housing, cumulatively resulting in a loss of wildlife. Um, now, there is no intention um, for anything but maintenance access and ed ecological enhancements via the footbridge, hence the reason and the need for all of the conditions that are in the officer's report and also contained within the addendum. So whilst we're highlighting that that was an objection that was received, um, each application would be assessed on its merits, and this is not a suitable site for um, any form of <coughs> housing <coughs> development at Little Britain Island. Accordingly, the application is recommended for approval with the conditions in the officer's report and the addendum. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mandip. Yeah, and I'd uh, draw members' attention to the, the addendum, which is uh, which is in front of you. Um, so we have a petition um, against uh, this particular item um, this evening, item number six. So I'd like to invite uh, is it Mr. Chowan, Val Harvey, and Jackie Derrimpool. If you'd like to come forward, and I'll just give you. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So, look, Lord Randall, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> just uh, for completeness, I'll just explain to yourself how it works so that everybody in the uh, in the gallery there can work. So, you have five minutes to present to the committee um, your petition. Um, the traffic light system in front of us here is indicated four minutes on green one minute on amber and then when it draws to red I will draw you to a close at that point sir. so um, if you could press the button in the middle when you're ready to talk and then we will start the clock Up to you. okay well thank you very much and good evening um, I've known this area ever since I was a boy and something is very dear to me so when I first heard about this bridge I made some inquiries and I was told as you've just been told by the officer that this was to um, give access to the Environment Agency's monitoring post or something on the far side of the island which am I allowed to get up which is, is, is roughly here now as you'll see there's a bridge across that uh, across the river there and although it's uh, marks as if it come through, it did come through Huntsmore Weir. I have now checked, and there is actually access on a title deed granted to the Environment Agency at any time for them to come through. That has been verified. They have a, a, a gate with a padlock, and they have a key to it, so they can come in, and they have been coming in, and there's been evidence they have coming in. So the next thing that occurred, I thought, was strange because I didn't think we should be uh, actually going on there if there was no good reason. So, I noticed from the, the, the last officer's report, they actually say that this bridge should be padlocked and only allows for environment agents. I think that's true. Is that not right in the, in the, the last thing I saw? So, then the question is why? So, originally there were some angling swims, some fishing swims put in, and some access, which was not a good idea because there's plenty. I mean, local authorities have done an excellent job around Little Britain. Um, so, anything here even if they wanted to go up there. That's thick brush, so you would have to cut some stuff down. There are, I won't go into the biodiversity, there, there's ecological reports, there are other reports that I think you may have come across. I believe personally that there's a, there's a red-listed bird that may well come back. It's the last place I saw it locally, the lesser spotted woodpecker, and that's a bit niche, but it, I, think it'll come, I think there's a good chance that they've started increasing it. So why? Why that bridge? Now, I agree it would be totally unsuitable for housing, uh, but I remember, and some of you, I see some of you have been doing this job admirably for some considerable time, I think the last time I was called into action was an island uh, called Fraze Island, a bit further up off Fraze Lee, where the developer there said he wanted a bridge to go across to just maintain the island. And that was refused, because it was very likely that they wanted to build on it. Now, I don't think that, because this been, the application has been put in by the local authority, that local authority are going to become developers. I don't honestly think that that's in their plan. But once the bridge is there, it's, it's possible. So the other thing is, if you've got a bridge which is going to be padlocked, it's going to have to have, to make it effective, it's going to have to have covering. Because if you just have a padlock, 
I probably can't manage to get it over nowadays, but I suppose with a stool or something I do. But there's lots of people who can jump across that padlock bridge and still get access. So what is the point? So it will look then an eyesore. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know that area, and it's beautiful. I would just say, and I'm conscious of time, there's another big application being discussed later. I would say, why are we looking at this? If this is local authorities' money, I would say, and I know it's all different pots, I never quite got my head round it, you're far better. There's a lot of problems at the moment with fly tipping and litter, and quite frankly, a couple of CCTV cameras, mo mo mobile or whatever, would enhance this area a lot more. If it was purely that, that was, there was no access there, I might reluctantly have to think it could be done. But actually, there's no point in it, and I think it's a waste of uh, council taxpayers' money. That, I'm afraid, is my, my point of view, and I would ask the local authority to withdraw their application. Okay, no, thank uh, you. Do you have any questions? I was just about to invite, is there any questions from uh, members? Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, basically, uh, this has been puzzling me. Why do you think the bridge is being built? I honestly have got no idea at all. I've I've really struggled to think. I can't think of anything particularly devious. I think what actually happened was that originally uh, the Environment Agency came on. Perhaps they didn't. A different section didn't realise they had full access whenever they wanted it. They put in an application and then I think once it's done, I think you'll know sometimes of these things, once somebody's got it in their mind to do it, they'll carry on doing it and, and won't admit that actually there's no point in it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can just say that I was at the um, planning meeting on the 2nd of August 2017 um, I do not have a photographic memory, but I did go back, and because uh, we now have so much of this recorded on YouTube, um, at that stage, the officer presentation said they wanted the bridge in order to open it up for public access. I asked if this was going to be unrestricted public access. Can and that, that question to the petitioner? It, it will be a okay. question. Thank you, Chair. It will be a question. And um, at, at that point, we uh, got into impact on the flora and fauna, the diversity, etc. Um, do you believe, or have you heard anything that would lead one to believe that once the bridge is up, even though it may have a padlock on now, that that would uh, prevent public access to it? Maybe not for housing, but something that could impact on the biodiversity of that island. Thank you. Well, first of all, may you say I, through the magic of YouTube, actually saw that planning meeting. I've seen it, and I, I'd like to congratulate those people who were on it because they asked all the right questions and had it deferred. Um, I think the answer to your question is I can't see, because I've pointed out that they have access to, that other, to, 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 to the monitoring or whatever it's called, I cannot see why they want that open. And once you've got a bridge there, somebody could come along at a later stage and say that would be a great place for A, B or C. And we have precious few. I mean, we're lucky in Hillingdon. We have got some very good habitats. Little Britain, actually, is one of the best. It really is. If, uh, if, you, haven't, if you haven't been around there, I, I recommend it. Um, it's a bit flooded at the moment, which is another question, because I'm not sure, I'm not an expert, but I have a feeling sometimes the bridges, there's a bridge a bit further down, actually can cause a little bit and obviously we've had some severe rain and it's all flooded there today but in answer to your question Council Duncan to be honest I'd like to think nice things but I can't see any good reason why there's a bridge port proposed okay thank you is there any more questions for the petitioner no okay thank you very much if you can return to your seat Right, OK. We've heard, uh, we've heard quite a bit um, this evening, first item on the agenda, so I'll throw it open to, uh, to the members to debate. Councillor Duncan. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was surprised to see this uh, come back um, in this way um, because 
particularly as all parties in the Council uh, recently held quite an important vote on climate change and um, are drawing up a, a programme and strategy for um, uh, conservation and climate change. And I think, as was said at the previous meeting in August, in order to get the bridge across and people across, um, you're going to have to remove trees anyway. This seems a bit perverse when we already are embarking on major tree planting program. Um, the reason that I supported deferral last time was so that we could learn more about the flood risks. And although I've seen the uh, information, um, as has been referred to by Lord Randall, I think that maybe we need to reappraise that in the light of the climate change data and information that we're receiving and that everybody's having to reassess the position. Um, but also because I was concerned about how this would affect um, uh, species on the island. At the moment, there's been no contact at all with no human contact. The people that have gone there have been trespassers. They've been few, and they've gone across the, the bridge uh, without authority, one would, would understand from the photographs that I think we've all seen, because there's litter there. Um, we do get people who go to remote places, some people who are homeless, uh, who live in their cars in the summer or um, in the winter rather will move into areas which are unsupervised and camp there during the summer. So you will get uh, human beings going to certain areas. This always results in some damage to the area. It's been left there for I think hundreds of years undisturbed um, and I don't see why we need to do it now. We were sent information which actually shows the Environment Agency on the 6th of February last year on the bridge, which looks perfectly fine and substantial, going across, giving access to the island for everything they need to do there. So I'm opposed to this. There doesn't seem to be any need, and I think it would just cause ecological damage and really fly in the face of the climate change motion that we passed only a short while ago. Thank you. Okay, thanks to you, Councillor Duncan. I've got a couple of councillors indicated here, but James Roger, you wanted to come in on that point. Yeah, um, the, the key consideration here isn't the need, it's whether it complies with our planning policies or not. Um, so, in, in this particular case, the reason officers are recommending approval is because we've, through conditions, and the conditions are pivotal, uh, in particular conditions 10 and 11, uh, and also I might add condition 13 that's in the addendum, we, we, we feel that those conditions mitigate the ecological harm and it was ecology that which was why it was deferred uh, previously at a planning committee meeting and so effectively you've got conditions that weren't on the table in 2017 because they're actually, um, they not going into too much detail, they're very robustly worded conditions so they, they, they will pre prevent unfettered public access. The intention is it's only for those that have a real need to access the island for maintenance reasons. Now, I know what I'm about to say may be slightly controversial. All the information we have as an officer team is that there's still considered to be a need to have a bridge to access the, the islands for um, our green spaces and environment agency to do what they feel they, they, they need to do. Uh, um, oh, sorry, i just ask if Amanda's got anything to add, but Yes, so that would that, that, be my main comment. Also, there are no loss of trees. So if you look at the tree officer comments, because of the design of the bridge, it's considered that it wouldn't have an impact on um, tree roots, primarily because it's sort of a, a lift a crane on and, and drop it into place, as opposed to an invasive um, method of construction. Uh, there's also, that's dealing with the loss of trees and your issues with regard to air quality. And with regard to the need, like as James has already said, it's not essential for us to demonstrate the need. However, the Environment Agency comments are supportive of the proposal to allow them to have access. The original officer report did record that the Environment Agency specifically... Um, I'm going to try and find you the page. So page 22 of the, of the committee report does set out a letter that we received from the Environment Agency in August 2017 
setting out the reason why they were supportive of the proposals, primarily because they were having to use other powers and at significant cost in order to gain access to carry out maintenance. Um, so they, they are supportive, and even through the reconsultation in 2019, so late last <coughs> year, they're supportive of the proposals alongside the mitigation that's now proposed with the ecological report. Can we give a simple example on this need issue? So we've got a North Committee later tonight where there'll be s some applications for people to extend their houses. We won't be discussing whether those people need a fourth, fifth or sixth bedroom to their house. We'll be simply assessing whether the extensions comply with council planning policies or not. And effectively, the same principle applies here. So the question for the committee is, do the, do the conditions officers are recommending, do they address... Uh, the reason it was previously deferred, those concerns over the e ecology issues. Thank you for that. Um, Sorry, this, Councillor Duncan, I'm just going to... Are you responding to...? I'm responding to, yes, James Rogers' point. OK, can we go around, because we've got some other councillors that have indicated, so I'll just, I'll, I'll, I've got you listed down, Councillor Duncan, but we'll go around in order of people showing me their hands. So, uh, Councillor Goddard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I must say uh, James has gone some way to responding to my concern, but I, I must say I'm bemused by uh, what Lord Randall has had to tell us. I mean, if there is a bridge there and it is fit for purpose, um, then it, you know, I'm perplexed as to why it is that, that this uh, extra bridge is needed. And uh, uh, whilst I take the point that uh, it's not necessarily the role of this committee to consider need, um, I, I, I'm not sure that this letter uh, from the Environment Agency gives us enough grounds to understand that need. So I, I do wonder whether we could seek whether um, we could seek uh, some sort of adjournment on this and, and greater clarification about that need because I, I think this uh, this explanation is inadequate. Okay, so um, we'll ask any comments on what Councillor Goddard has raised there around the access. If members would defer it, it would be, be because they are still concerned over the ecological issue, not because... Uh, I, I, I fear what you may have been implying is that it would be the need argument as to why you'd wish it deferred. And, and, and the reason I gave you the example of household e extensions, we, we, we would never defer an item to ask an applicant why they feel the need to extend their house. We would simply decide whether the extension to the house is acceptable or not. So... I, I, I feel that members maybe need to question officers and whether we feel the concerns, material planning issues have been addressed or not, rather than this need argument. That's if I can respond. Do you want to come back to that, Councillor Goddard? Yes, if, if, if possible. Um, to me, the concern here is that, that, that I mean, it's clear a lot of work has gone into the conditioning, and I understand that and I appreciate that. Um, However, I, I think there's little doubt that from an environmental point of view, if it were possible to dispense with this bridge, the impact on the environment would be better. The outcome would be better. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I struggle somewhat. I, I can see the point that we don't assess um, house owners' needs, um, but th this, this is really operating, at, for me, at a rather different level. Um, uh, and so... You know, I, I'm sorry, I, I would like to understand the need f rather better. OK, maybe we'll, uh, we'll get to that and see what the other councillors will come up with. So I've now got uh, Councillor Hagger, you indicated. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a few questions. Um, thank you for bringing up the Weir Bridge. Um, so one of the questions I have on that is I'm not quite getting my head around the fact that we're saying we've got restricted access but we have a weir bridge. So can someone just explain why there's restricted access and yet a moment ago we're hearing that we can have access across that bridge. That's the first thing. And the second thing I really want to, a bit more evidence really, is that if we didn't have the second bridge that's in here, um, what issues would that bring up? Now, I know we've got it all in there, but looking at if we're using the first bridge and not the bridge, the second one that's being built, 
I, I don't, I'm not actually, I don't quite understand. I know we're talking about the conditions, but I, I just don't understand with the restricted access and yet we have a bridge. That's what I'm struggling with. My understanding is that when the application was originally lodged, there was definitely an issue with the Environment Agency gaining access across private land. So what we're hearing is that recently there hasn't been an issue, but nonetheless they need to gain access across private land. Obviously what this proposes is access via local authority land onto the island and then they get round to the weir. So, but I can't advise committee on property law, um, but that's my simplistic understanding. Right, so I just, just want to clarify that. So what I, my understanding of what you just said is that the weir bridge to access that is on private property to get across to that bridge. Is that, that's so, what we're so, saying, So what isn't Lord it? Randall was saying is he's viewed the documents and he's satisfied that as a result of viewing those documents that the Environment Agency would be able to access from the private lands to, uh, to the weir. Uh, what I can say without getting too legalistic is it is a case where the Environment Agency are having to cross private land. So my understanding was it was that concern over the access across private land that led to the uh, discussion with the council about going from council lands directly to the island. I think if I were to expand too far, I may, I may go beyond my knowledge of the matter, but that, uh, I feel safe saying what I've said. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Higgins, you indicated? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I wasn't here on the... 2017, I was probably doing something else. Um, you know, I can see both sides of it. I have to remember where I am and what this is about. I'm, a, I'm in here in a planning committee discussing a planning uh, application. The problem I can see is that, yes, there is access, but the, the access is unattainable for us on the whims of landowners. Um, I don't know whether there's further conditions we can put in or something to I, I have I have there's two problems I have with it to be well one problem really is that this bridge is is not it's not anybody can jump over a, a small gate that's locked it's it's irrelevant you know mm -hmm. um, I do appreciate that we do need to access I'm concerned that that the designer has designed it in such a way to make it less harmful to them but not functional for what it's needed to be for its for which is to get access to uh, look after that small bit of land. Um, I think we, as a committee we're going to find it very difficult to find reasons for objection, and even though that's a local authority issue, that's, that's the problem. Um, so I, I would, we could, I suppose as a committee, we could ask see if there was a way of getting an agreement with the landowner that we could have access on a, on a regular basis, but I have a tendency to think that their problems will be I don't think we would have gone down this avenue if that was the case so you know I, with a heavy heart I mean I'm gonna I, I do not like the design of the bridge I don't think it's functional um, so there's my rub on it really I'm afraid so I'm, I'm in two minds to be honest and legally I think we have no addition. I think uh, Glenn's gonna come in on that point yes thank you chairman um, tempting though it is for committees to get involved in property issues I would really caution against that because the council will end up being a mediator over a situation it can't control. I think one advantage, it's not for me to expand the virtues of this application, but one advantage of this bridge is it's, uh, the access is on land owned by the council. Access has to be approved by the council. The, 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 there has to be a plan approved by the council given who, who can go on there and when. So control then is fully, fully within the council. At the moment, as, as Councillor Higgins said, access is subject to the whims of who may happen to be the owner of the land at any one time. And there is evidence here that in the past, certainly, the Environment Agency have had to serve statutory notices to gain access. There is also a public interest here in the Environment Agency and the Council being able to carry out works on there that, 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 are, for, that are for the public benefit. If, 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 if the application is granted and the bridge is built, then in accordance with the access strategy, those works can be carried out. They won't be subject to potential delay because of a dispute or someone wanting payment or something at some time. So I have to say, Chairman, it's not a property issue, it's not a matter for this committee. Very helpful. Thank you for that, Glenn. One thing, Chairman. I just want to who owns the weir? Can officers tell me that? So I really want to know. It's, it's under the 
Mm. It's in the ownership of <coughs> Hunts Moor Weir. So, this so we don't even site. Own that we don't own the weir. So, we don't, so basically, the whole thing from not even just getting access, we don't own the weir at all either. So, we, we, we don't own, have any. We might have access to that the landing side, yes, point. And that's but, it. but that's it. So, we can make sure that they don't get access to. Hours, no. Yeah, exactly. I think that might be another reason why they don't want to give access because they probably use it themselves. There you go. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Duncan, you indicated. Um, well, I think. Sorry, no, it's Councillor it's Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Councillor Moss. Um, I think we're all confused. <laughs> okay. Why this application is coming? The way has obviously been maintained for a substantial period of time, so access is obviously possible. I then look at this site, and it's uh, a unique heritage site in, in the sense that the environment is almost pristine. Uh, we have in the report clear evidence of litter uh, and abuse by human presence. And then I looked at some of our policies. This is Hillington's planning policies. We can go policy HG1, heritage. The council will conserve and enhance Hillington's distinctive and varied environments, its settings and distinctive variety. I don't see in allowing this bridging and actually enhancing the ability of humans to access the site we compliant with that policy because you seem to think there was a cons concern about how we could possibly uh, refuse this. I'll then talk about policy EM3. To promote, and I'll read this out, to promote and contribute to the positive enhancement of the strategic river and canal corridor and the associated wildlife through such plans as the bi biodiversity action plan. I again, do not see how this application complies with our policy. And thirdly, I want to go on to the Natural and Environment Rural Communities Act 2006, Section 41. If significant harm results from a development and cannot be avoided through reallocation or at least a large resort compensation of law, then planning permission should be refused. So I would also argue on Section 41 we should refuse this, this application. And when I look at this, um, I can't think of a more unique, sort of, uh, a unique location, which uh, just the presence of potentially dogs or humans uh, would disturb the local environment. And it's it's so rich, I'm not qualified to comment on on the variety of it. But I actually think it's substantial. And I think from our point of view, we're raising these issues because I've had an issue of recalling our reasons for refusal before. But we, 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 this has now been discussed, so we can actually consider using these points. And this is why we have, we do not believe this conforms to Hillinger's planning policies. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Councillor Duncan? Thank you. You can go there. You, can, you have your turn now. <laughs> um, uh, I take the, uh, the points that um, James was making, which I wanted to follow up on, which are um, extensions to houses are in the developed area. Uh, well, of course one doesn't ask uh, whether people need them or not. Um, sometimes they don't, they're just doing it to add value. Um, but this is a site of importance for nature conservation and it's in the green belt. And so there's a presumption against development of any kind um, and so need can be one of the things one looks at. Yes, if there's going to be forestry or this, that and the other and one needs to gain access to that, then of course um, one would look at that in that way and say, yes, people need to gain access to this. Um, this hasn't arisen in all the time that this island has been there. That's why it's a very, very protected area and has been referred to and agreed, I think, by all. It's one of the most beautiful areas of the borough and very accessible to people. We've already seen photographs of litter on the island when there's no access at all, uh, when it's going through this so-called restricted access area through private property, and yet still people are getting onto that island. If you put a bridge on public land, I don't think any of us, unless we're lying to ourselves, will think that people aren't going to gain access. They will. It will do something to this island. It's been protected by its uh, remoteness, if you like. It's in the middle of um, uh, uh, the borough. It's all around us, and yet it's protected 
by that. We're guardians of that. We're safeguards, meant to be safeguarding this, not only for our generation, but future generations. And I think that this um, shows, these photographs, it says, how did the EA staff get to their bridge and where, along the same route they have used for the past 26 years? Now, I don't think that um, the EA who have got powers of access to wherever they need, I know this isn't an issue, but we're talking about development in the green belt. Um, if they've been happily gaining access, and as recently as February went there to have a clean up, um, there doesn't seem to me to be any issue. It's green belt, it's importance, a site of importance for nature conservation. We must take this very seriously and I urge all members to do that. Please. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Councillor Morgan, did you indicate? Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I've actually got uh, grave issues on this application. Um, I can actually speak from experience when, as a, a young lad, I lived on a small island and the authorities built a second bridge and they said no we lock it up nobody else can cross it it didn't happen um, somebody forgets to lock the gate or they, the gate gets vandalized and suddenly it's open for everyone but not just that if we look to see where we're proposing this new bridge to get to the point that the EA uh, officers want to be They've got to cut through wood, uh, court, uh, copses and everything like that to get there. So you're going to end up with a public footpath going down the length of the island. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really actually having problems agreeing with this uh, proposal. Okay, thank you. Councillor Higgins, you indicated? Yeah, um I'm, I was fortunate enough to be a cabinet member in the beginning when Little Britain and the investment that we put into Little Britain Lake. So for us to say that we don't care about the area, I think is a bit rich, especially coming from that side. Um, I just think that um, there. I mean, are we saying that there is no public access? The officers confirm that. I mean, that, the, the, the shortest answer is the. Maybe I watch too many Bond films. We really need a bridge that retracts itself and comes out when you just need it. But, um, um, you know, um, or a drawbridge or something like that might be a better option to this. Um, but, I, as I said, I, I, I understand what the committee is saying, and I do sympathise with residents about this, but, as I said, this is a planning committee, and we have to be very careful, especially putting stuff forward for, for um, uh, reasons for refusal that are very weak. Um, um, but oh, that's all I have to say on that. Okay. I think uh, James yeah, Rogers wants to come in on that um, point. The, there isn't actually a greenbelt issue because there are certain forms of uh, development that are not considered inappropriate in the greenbelt, and that can include engineering operations. So members will be aware that have, have heard it many times that sport and recreation and cemeteries and certain uses are acceptable, but it actually engineering operations can be when there's not an impact on, on the openness and in this case the bridge is a quite small scale engineering operation so I think I think this is about the ecology it's, it's not about uh, about the uh, green belts um, uh, and the position officers have come to is that with the conditions including condition 13 and I must stress condition 13 uh, requires a biodiversity enhancements we think that um, the conditions in their totality are such that we can't refuse this on ecology. That, that's basically where, where, where we've got to as officers. Okay, thank you. We've got a number of other councillors and I am conscious of time, but it's good to give this subject a good airing. Um, Councillor Hagger, you indicated again. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, it's a really difficult one, this, because I agree with what Councillor Higgins is saying. Um, we also need to look at the island, because above all, it is the island, and we do need access to it uh, to keep it in an ecological state. Um, can you just answer me the question, how much access is needed, are they saying, throughout the year to keep it well maintained? Uh, if I can say a point that hasn't been raised yet, my understanding is that at certain times of the year people wade across yeah. to get to the island. So just to clarify, they're not going across, clambering across the, the weir, they're going across because the water is shallow enough 
that they're finding a way to access the island. And the consequence of that is that litter and rubbish is on the island, which, uh, uh, and then uh, this council <coughs> has teams that can clear up litter and, and effectively the bridge, um, the green spaces team can do visits to the island and as necessary, um, uh, you know, the, the rubbish can be cleared and um, ecological enhancements could happen. So it, there's a lot of comments being made that the bridge may cause ecological harm. It, it's possible it could work the other way because uh, what the conditions are doing is, is preventing public access but allowing the Environment Agency and the Council's Green Spaces team access. And what, what we're saying, and maybe I haven't expressed it, neither I might have made it clear enough thus far in the meeting, is that we think that effectively creates a tipping point where the ecological benefits combined with uh, the conditions mean that it could be a positive rather than a negative. But it does obviously need the right gate to prevent um, unfettered public access. How many times is the access? That was my question. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't actually know the answer to your question. Um, that, that, sorry, that makes a, quite a big difference yeah. because if we've got a bridge in there and we're only accessing it four times a year or are we talking about access once I mean this, for me it, it's how much how, we get, how, how many times are we accessing it I really think we need to find that out I actually really do think we need to look see okay how many times are we going to be accessing this that's a massive for me that's a really massive question ok Councillor Melvin you indicated Yes, I did. Um, the thing is, most of my concerns have been voiced anyway. But the biggest thing is that when humans interact with wildlife, the wildlife suffers. It's as simple as that. And I, I am not comfortable with allowing access to an island which has been perfectly preserved, no problems, lovely wildlife and everything. So I'm, I'm sorry, but most of my concerns have been brought up. But that was just something else I wanted to add. I mean, we're looking at, you know, something that the wildlife that's been there undisturbed for years and years and years. And I know for a fact, like Councillor Morgan was saying, you allow humans in and all hell breaks loose, basically. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Duncan, you indicated again. Yeah, thank you. Um, just on uh, the, this issue of um, public access, I note that in the report, either parish council says no objection because this will provide public appreciation and access to the site. So um, I know that we're saying there is no public access, but in 2017 we were saying there was unfettered public access. So have we really changed our position that much? Um, also, I'd just like to say that a gate would not prevent dogs and cats and other predators from gaining access to the island, um, and so there would be more predation on species there if we're talking about ecology. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Higgins, you wanted to come back? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, just two things. I mean, um, access... I think what <coughs> Councillor Haggard's actually uh, actually mentioned, but I would have assumed that it's because it's winter months, because um, you can actually um, I go to the sometimes when my son was little, we went to the fishing days, and he would take his socks and socks, and he'd be he'd be in the middle of that with his fishing rod trying to get a fish, you know, to win the competition. Um, I know that I mean it, it, I don't know whether it really it's not really the place for us to mention this, but. I know that we have a we have a budget setting, and in the budget there is um, two more offices for uh, Little Britain Lake. Anyway, um, I don't. Is there any way? I mean, I do. Con the concern that, that has been raised by Councillor Melvin is absolutely correct. Is there monitoring in place to do? Yeah. To, to, can we? I mean, maybe in some ways a way around this is to uh, grant the the situation, but to have a, a snapshot at this present moment of what the ecological effect is on that island and see whether in a year's time or six months that that's changed and if that's changed then we have to find an, another alternative to uh, uh, do it. I, don't, I mean it's just it's just out there I'm just trying to find yeah exactly yeah but we have to we have to as I, I keep going back to the point that this is a planning committee not 
not uh, not a policy making yeah. committee. So, it, you know, I'll leave that yeah. with officers. It, anyway. It's actually in condition 11 that there's yeah. a program of, for ecological surveys. If I can help committee slightly further, because I'm conscious you'll probably need to vote on this soon. Um, if we didn't have conditions 10, 11, 13, I might be able to help you kind of work out ways that you might not like this. The problem is, is having put in conditions 10, 11, and 13, effectively I feel the ecological harm is largely addressed. So therefore, I can't, I can't help you. Um, so members will be aware that I have helped committee tantamount overturn my own recommendations, but the difficulty here is that conditions 10, 11, 13 uh, address a lot of the eco ecological issues. Yes, certainly, coming uh, now. Mr yes, Chairman, I'd just like to reiterate that advice. Um, this is a planning committee. Um, you have to judge each case on planning merits. Um, need generally is not a planning consideration. Officers have have given a very detailed report here setting out the, the, the potential planning harm that can, can arise and officers have proposed conditions to deal with that harm. If members are minded to refuse this application, they need to be quite clear as to what planning harm they feel cannot be ameliorated by conditions. Thank you. Very useful. I think we've got a couple more councillors. I think Councillor Morsi wanted to come back in. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go on the final comments by the Hertfordshire and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. This looks reasonable on paper, but the likely reality will be that it will not be enforced and people will ignore the signage. It is too great a risk to have, to have such as limited benefit to people. And therefore, I'm going to put it on, I'm going to propose, we reject officers' proposals on, we, we are going to quote HE1, EM3 and section 41 of that show at 2006 as reason for refusal. I'm proposing that. Okay, right, I've got Councillor Goddard who's indicated. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it, it does seem to me that the condition which uh, <coughs> denies access to the general public to, to this area um, is perhaps inconsistent with the design of the bridge uh, because, as has been said, you know, any, anybody can vault over a, a locked gate. Uh, I mean, is there not potential for actually looking at the design of the bridge again um, to make sure that... Uh, you know, we mean what we say, and that access is absolutely denied. Yeah. You want to come in on the Councillor Goddard's comment there? I mean, part of the reason we, 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 we thought it best to deal with the security bit via a condition is we didn't really want to be getting too detailed with the security mechanisms. Um, in terms of public sort of documents that you've then uh, sharing in a public forum. I mean, we, we think, we thought as officers that it um, shouldn't be too difficult to, given that it's only a narrow pedestrian bridge, to come up with a gate and some ancillary railings or whatever may be required that uh, prevent any person accessing Ireland bar a determined person that if they're that determined would just w w walk across um, as we know people do all r ready in effect um, I mean unfortunately with planning applications um, we just have to deal with the plans that are before us in effect um, <coughs> sorry I, I appreciate I'm not, not maybe not, not helping you on this one <laughs> apologies for that okay well Generate, there's a lot of interest this evening, certainly, but we've got Councillor Beera has indicated and then Councillor Melvin. I've just got one question. We'll let Councillor Beera have He's been sitting there patiently all evening, so we'll let him have his. Thank you, Chair. Just been look, uh, listening to all the comments from various councillors, and uh, my really concern is the bridge. For that reason, I support my colleague and I second that. Okay, I'm probably going to need a bit of help on the proposal that's been made, but we'll come back to that in a second. So, Councillor Melvin. I thought my voice was loud enough, but obviously not. Um, just a couple of uh, questions. First of all, I'd like to ask why the bridge is built at that angle. Right, that's just a, a question. But the, the other one is, we've got all these wonderful conditions, but how are we going to be ensure that those conditions are kept. I mean, are we going to have 
you know, 24 hour surveillance. So we're going to have. Because they, they're great, the conditions are fantastic. But how do we enforce them? I, I, the first point is straightforward. It's because of the trees on, on the island. Trees. Uh, yeah, it's the trees that have dictated the angle. Uh, uh, um, I mean, we, we, th there was a lot of effort put into the wording of the conditions to ensure that they were, excuse the pun, watertight. Uh, um, so, effectively, Condition 10 is requiring uh, security, um, effectively, gate and other mechanisms that uh, are sufficient to prevent public access other than those that we feel should have access, which is set out in the condition itself. Uh, um, so, I, I can't see a problem with, with that, because the intention is that, we, is that there's a robust enough gate that it prevents public access. Um, I mean, I'd add that if it's not robust enough, then the council will. The council doesn't want access to, to the island unfettered because then it has to deal with the rubbish and the implications. So I, I don't think you know, the applicant uh, um, has any intention of doing anything other than a secure gate. The, so I, I can't see any, any issues we would have difficulty enforcing. I, I can tell them Mandit's about to add something, so I'll pass to her. I also think that we, we obviously have a planning enforcement team who will enforce against breaches of conditions, but it's in our own interest to ensure that the conditions are complied with because it's our land. Therefore, the Green Spaces team who manage um, and ensure that the land is kept um, fair and good to some extent, there will be two separate parties within the local authority who will be keen to ensure the enforcement of the conditions. Sorry, I, I, I understand the council has some wardens for Little Britain Lake. I may be digressing a bit. So, so, so there is a presence that, there, that the council has, uh, obviously not 24-7, but there is, uh, it, it, it isn't the case that, that a resident has to call uh, the council and people come out to Little Britain Lake, there's already a, a manned present at certain times of the week so it's through the warden service. Okay, so we, we're going to have to navigate our way around this next bit, uh, conscious, so, but I just want Councillor Higgins to come yeah. in as a final point. No, there, there is, I know, uh, there's more uh, officers going to be on site after the budget, tomorrow if we pass the budget. So that's I can understand residents saying that they haven't seen them. That's absolutely correct, but there is in the budget two extra officers for their site. Um, the, uh, the thing, the, the angle of the bridge, I asked that question. I didn't want to keep talking all the time, although a politician that never shuts up is very rare anyway. But um, the, um, the angle is, I don't understand, the, the angle looks like to me that it's, it's encouraging uh, it's, not, it's not regarded as a maintenance. I can understand if you put a pin on the island and you just move the bridge close to the fence so it was like a separate entity not wrapping around near the path, then it looks like it's more like of a maintenance thing rather than encouraging people to go through. I know it's a small thing, but it's about perception. Um, so, I'm, again, I'll ask that question. Why can't that bridge be closer to the property uh, the closed where it says closed boarding fencing rather than at an angle which d definitely seems that it's adjoining to the pathway that's running around the running around the there and I think that might so I mean and it's not going to sort <coughs> the whole problem out but it will give more of an indication that it is there I if you're going across it it's you're not meant to go across it because it's not part of the pathway but you know it's officers can explain Something that we can look at, you know, just through the chairman and the and the lead, but um, opposition, um, and also, can you please give me the reasons for refusal that have been put on the, on the floor? Can officers uh, please explain whether they are substantial or not? So I don't think we can comment on why the bridge is where it is. It has been designed following um, surveys of
both parcels, so either side um, of the River Colne. Obviously, James Rogers has indicated that it's most likely to be landing away from tree roots on the other side, but could it be further away from the, what you're indicating as a pedestrian path? Is a is yes, a fair I mean, question, but yeah, then that's, does that's that? That's a question because there is a tree. I mean, to answer that question is, is there is a tree. If you put if you put the the, the landing on the the main land uh, nearer to the property where the, the private land is, it doesn't it doesn't affect. There's a tree root <coughs> system there. You can see there's a tree there that the path is going towards. So I don't understand. I understand there's a problem on the basis of the ground on the actual island in the middle, but there's nothing on our side that would not permit us moving that closer if you just take make it rather vertical rather than it is at an angle, um, then that would solve a lot of issues because it would look like it's actually a maintenance thing rather than a, an, an opportunity for someone to <coughs> pop their kids over the fence and say, oh, well, let's all go over and have a look, you know? Okay, everyone's had a really good air. Councillor Morgan, you indicated again. <coughs> just, just very quickly. Um, We've got. You know, sorry, Councillor Morse. You did say Councillor Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am still you know, listening to everything that's been said. For an environmental officer to get from the new bridge to where the station is for him to do the scientific work, he's got to have a footpath across the island or the, yeah. down the length of the island, um, which is against our, um, our, 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 our plans. And with that, I am having extreme difficulties in supporting this. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm just going to come to that now. So we have, we have a proposal put forward by Councillor Morse. Pardon me, Mr Chairman, but we've got a proposal on the, on the table to reject it. I'm a bit surprised that we didn't act upon that, uh, but uh, I don't know what the rules are of chairmanship. Well, I'm going to put that, to, to, if you could just clarify what your proposal was, because I think we I'll need to... It. It. Yep. If you could put your mic on. I apologise. Uh, policy H1, policy EM3, and section 41 of the uh, Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006. And that's what's on the table. And the reason it's on the table, because it was prevaricating all over the place. I didn't interrupt because I actually politely let it all go on. But I think we, we are in safe ground. Okay, so your proposal has been seconded by Councillor Birra. So that proposal is live and on the floor. So can I have a show of hands for the proposal? Mr Chairman, before we go to a vote, can we just ask officers to advise the committee whether those objections, as we would do if we were doing an uh, extension in a, in a thing, we would have officers' recommendations to say whether they feel those are strong, and I would like legal advice as well to say whether that is strong as well before we ask for a vote. If that's okay. Well, the proposal's on there, so there's a question you've asked, and then as soon as we get the answers, we will go to a vote. Thank you, Chairman. Um, hey. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of pieces of individual legislation that refer to planning these days. None of them is like a, a knockout blow that give, that's either in favour of planning permission or against it. What I'm clear about is the planning considerations are carefully set out in the report. Officers have given their judgment. It's the members to decide whether to follow that advice, bearing in mind they can only reject this application on planning considerations. I would just add one thing that's been raised by a number of members about the enforceability of the conditions in access. Um, on page 11, condition 10, access has to be approved in writing by the Council's Green Spaces team, and it can only be for those purposes specified. So there will be a record within the Council as to why access is requested, whether that has been granted or not. So there is, if you like, independent monitoring there going on. It's not as though it's being left to an independent party, to, to a private landowner, just to do that. So I don't know if that gives members some assurance, but I'm quite clear if, if members are quite... Uh, it's lawful to grant planning permission. Whether to grant planning permission or not is a matter for individual members' judgment. <coughs> okay, thank you. <coughs> Taking a step back, if we go back to Councillor Morse's two policies, which were HE1 Heritage. Heritage listed under uh, point number one of the policy refers to registered parks and gardens, 
listed buildings, conservation areas, scheduled ancient mon monuments. So it's not a heritage asset under the definition of policy HE1. It's a conservation area. But the argument that was put forward was that of the setting of the ecological value. So, okay, that's fine. If we turn to policy EM3, to some extent, policy EM3 is looking at enhancing positive enhancements to um, strategic rivers and canals and providing sufficient access. So it counters the need for the bridges required for the enhancements to meet the policy. I, I, it would be difficult to defend based on those policies that you put forward as a ref, as a refusal reason. It is obviously your your decision. I'm giving you the advice on what the policy wording says in local plan part one. James, come in. I mean, policy HE one talks about promoting increased public awareness, understanding of, and access to the borough's heritage assets and wider historic environment. Um, obviously, the issue here is concerned over actually having increased public access. So, um, yeah, I, these policies don't seem to, to be an ideal fit. I, I, I know where, where, where the member's coming from, that it's concern over ecological harm, but the policies being citing, cited just don't seem an ideal fit, if I'm to be blunt. <laughs> okay. Councillor Duncan? Yeah. Can I quickly? just say that the officers are here to assist members, yeah. and... Uh, members have discussed this item. They they are far more au fait with the policies, particularly as there are certain ones that have been approved more recently as well. And they are using them on a daily basis that we are not. And I would like some advice. Earlier on, James said, if I were here advising members on how to refuse this, I could do that. But having put this forward, this is the um, officer's view and that they would not speak about um, reasons for refusal. Well, I think enough of us have concerns around this table that we would like officers' advice on that. And if there has to be a detailed reason for refusal that is agreed outside this meeting, but based on the wider concerns that we have all said and understand and, and people who have written in and objected to this also understand that. They don't need a policy. We all, we all, all reasonably intelligent people who are aware of issues in the environment. I would ask for officers' assistance on this, not their opposition. Thank you. Sorry, can I, can I just get... To, we, we do need to... We have got a proposed and we have got a seconded and we do need to get that... Uh, organised before we can move on to concluding this application for the scene. So, Councillor Higgins, did you want to make a yeah, point no, there? I, I, I just really want to say, I mean, it, 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 officers can't defend themselves, and, and I did ask, let's make it very clear, I did ask for the comments to be made. That's, so, I'm all I'm saying is that. So, Councillor Morton, I think we do need to get the to point, that point. I think I'll check up Councillor Duncan's point. Previous in the past, if there's a decision made which is against officers, officers then add other reasons in if they fit, and that would seem an appropriate situation. These were picked because they, they, they jumped out at me. There have been reasons where we're not complying with our own policies. OK, well, I think that's a view for, for members to take, I think. So at that point, then, we have a proposal put forward by Councillor Morse to reject this under a number of policies which we have debated. That has been seconded by Councillor Birra. I think we're at the point now where we can actually have a show of hands either in favour or not against Councillor Morse's proposal. All those in favour? All those against? All those in, all those in favour, to clarify? All those against? Okay. So that's that's carried. Okay. So that application is refused. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So so um, I'll, I'll refer back to the chairman and Labour lead and um, assist as best I can. <laughs>
Okay, uh, let's draw breath for a, a moment or two from uh, from a marathon agenda item six. So uh, good to give that one uh, a good airing. So we'll now move on to agenda item seven, which is the former master brewer site, Friesland Way, Hillingdon. And again, I will pass over to uh, Mandit to take us through that one. So over to you. Thank you, Chair. Agenda item number seven is the former master brewer site at Hillingdon Circus. I'd like to make everyone aware that there is a addendum on this item, so we have received an additional neighbour letter, which doesn't raise any new matters. Uh, we have also received two valid petitions, which we hadn't received um, prior to publication. We have some admin in terms of updating our plans list to make sure that the um, decision is that we issue is accurate. We've also received building control comments with regard to fire compliance and the fire strategy that the applicants have um, submitted. The applicants have also provided a detailed written response to the Council post-publication of the committee report and provided three additional documents which we have not had sufficient time to review um, and do not form part of the refusal list um, of documents as such. So this time last year we had an application before us um, which we refused on the Master Brewer site um, and the application Today is a two to eleven story building providing to provide five hundred and fourteen residential units and commercial floor space at ground floor comprising B one offices, A one retail, and A three retail and D one community type uses. <coughs> so the application site is outlined in red. The green land to the north um, and to the east is green belt designated and just for clarification this is the A40 and then long lane running along the western boundary. So the landscape master plan um, shows some of the proposals. So this application is, is slightly different in that the areas of public open space are actually a better proposal than the scheme that we refused in um, February 2019. You may recall that the uh, public open space was, again, centrally located in the old scheme, but it was accessed via a multitude of ramps because it was located above a podium deck. So this application, in, in some respects, we don't have an amenity, um, sorry, the, we're not refusing it on the quality of the um, public open space that's proposed in this scheme. Um, it is demonstrably better than the previous the, we have a ground floor plan, so the development is divided into a series of blocks and then a linear block running along the northern boundary and then the western boundary connects up through. So that element of the design does not change from the last scheme that we refused. There is also the landmark feature that it's known as on the corner of Friesland Way and Long Lane. I'll take you up the building, so this is the first floor plan, the second floor, the third floor, Sorry, just to highlight that we do have parking under podium undercross on in some of these spaces. I think another plan will highlight that more clearly. So we have a second floor, a third floor, a fourth floor, fifth floor. So you'll see that we now have more breaks in the built form um, and some of the heights have, have been capped um, along, the, along the site to the north and then to the east. Take you up to the sixth floor, the seventh floor, the eighth floor ninth and tenth floor of the building. So the tallest element of the site is on the junction of the A40 flyover and Long Lane. So this is the um, elevation as would be viewed from the A40 <coughs> flyover. So the design has incorporated breaks in the facade, primarily because this is one long run of built form, um, which then wraps around the site. So this is the application site's southern elevation. We have some east elevations of the application site, so that's the section through from, as viewed from the green belt, which lies to the east of the application site, and then the further elevations from the west, which are, so this shows a little bit more clearly the, uh, the upward rise of the long lane um, road frontage. Some of the viewpoints that we now have as part of this planning application, I apologise for the quality of these images. When they were on my screen, they looked a little bit clearer. Um, but you probably can't see anything in 
viewpoint 10, but it is able to make out that there is an impact from this conservation area where the development is visible um, in the distance. And I apologize for the quality, but the documents are online if you wanted to see them. Again, this is um, viewpoint number 13, which has caused concern for our conservation and design officer, albeit we aren't refusing the scheme on, on heritage grounds, but this tries to give an indication of the break in the skyline um, and the additional built mass that's a concern for the council and one of the reasons for refusal. We have viewpoint 14. Again, it's this orange outline here, which is the proposed development, and obviously you have the existing situation at the site. And then viewpoint 15, again, we have the outline of the proposed development. If I take you through some of the application sites, so, uh, sorry, the photos, this is the photo of the site looking south. Um, Long Lane, where it crosses the A40, um, looking over the A40 towards the northeast. Now, the application site was used as a Royal Mail depot over the Christmas period, but that has ceased. Um, that is no longer a part of the function, but it is noticeable that a lot of the site has been cleared of um, tree coverage. So tree coverage that was there um, is no longer there, but the outer areas which are not within the applicant's ownership they do still have some trees but not to the extent that the site had tree coverage in the past apologies uh, so we have been through this application um, in in great detail we are recommending for the application for refusal for a number of reasons um, we have eight reasons for refusal um, as set out on pages 45 46 and 47 now, some members may question why we have less this time when it's a bigger scheme. However, we have received a lot of technical information from the applicants of this particular scheme, which we didn't receive last time round. And in order to make sure that we have the most robust case when it comes to a, um, a scenario of a planning appeal, we, we're confident that these are the reasons that would, be, um, would support us in any potential future appeal. Now, this application is recommended for approval. However, because it's a Refusal, I'm sorry. <laughs> Couldn't have got that one more wrong, could I? <laughs> so the application is recommended for refusal, but we do have to send a referral back to the Greater London Authority uh, because it's a referable scheme. So they have two weeks in which to make a decision whether they agree with our recommendations and allow us to proceed to make a decision or whether they should wish to call the application in. Accordingly, the application has been recommended for refusal. Okay, thank you, Mandip. Okay, this is our second petition item of yeah. of the evening. Yes, yeah, yeah. Petition item. Uh, second petition item of the evening. So I'd like to invite like to invite um, is it Humphrey Tizard or Jane Turnbull? If you'd like to come to the table. So again, for completeness, I will just explain how the, uh, the, the petition process works. So in front of you, you have your microphone. When you press the little red button, the, the, the time will start. You have five minutes in which to address uh, the committee this evening. Um, four minutes on green, one minute on amber, and when it gets to red, I will bring you to a close at that point. So uh, when you're ready, press the red button and you may present your petition. So, uh, as was pointed out, I'm, I'm representing the Ickenham Residents Association and uh, uh, councillors, I'm not going to take up much of your time this evening because we agree with the reasons given by your officers for refusal. Uh, we agree uh, that it would be an overdevelopment of the site and indeed we would go further. We would point out that the residential density levels in the proposal are double the acceptable levels set out in the Hillingdon's development plan. If you'd like me to go through the maths of that, I will. We agree that the design of the development will be completely discordant with the setting of North Hillington and mar the skyline as viewed from a number of aspects, including the Green Belt. It is far too tall and bulky for its setting. We would go further and claim that it would do substantial harm to the settings of our heritage assets. We agree that it would be insufficient parking provision. We agree that the applicants have not proved that the traffic generated would not further aggregate, aggra aggravate the overloading of the Hillington Circus Junction. We agree that the applicants have not shown how they will protect residents of their development from noise and air pollution. We agree that the design does not meet the local standards for amenity, space and sunlight. 
Council, as your offices have gone, recently gone to great efforts to produce a local plan which has been accepted by the GLA and has passed scrutiny by the Planning Inspectorate. It's a coherent plan to meet the local and regional needs respecting the nature of the borough and its built environment. We support it too, and the emerging, emerging Ickenham Neighbourhood Plan is most likely to, concer to concur with its guidance on developments at Hillington Circus. It has been accepted by all parties that residential development can take place on the Master Brewer site, albeit with some misgivings about the impact of noise and air pollution from the, from the A40 on its residents. The local planning authority knows full well the part that it must play in meeting the burgeoning housing needs of the southeast and has a very up-to-date local plan to address its obligations. So, councillors, you should have absolutely no reason to prefer the pleadings of a developer seeking to maximise its profits from the site to the sound local planning authority guidance accepted by the local community nor should you give weight to the GLA's opinion of the development, which is completely at odds with the local plan guidance, which it did not challenge before adoption just a few months ago. And if it should come to pass that the GLA call this in and reverses your decision to refuse, you should not shy away from asking the Secretary of State to intervene. History has shown that government inspectors almost invariably side with a local authority which is in a much better position to determine what is appropriate for its locality. Thank you. I'm Jane Turnbull talking for the Oak Farm Residents Association. We also wish to endorse the work of the officers in once again producing a comprehensive report for your committee and we agree with all the points made by Ickenham Residents Association. The proposed development, development would be the biggest single change to the local area in over 80 years. Hillingdon East has not seen development on this scale since the estates themselves were laid out on farmland. This proposal does not recognise local needs nor the feedback that was given to residents, uh, given by residents to the developer. It shows in their visual impact surveys that the development will soar six storeys above the chimney height of the Swallow Pub opposite, which is the highest point in Hillingdon Circus. In its commentary on the three new viewpoints made by Bradley Murphy Design Consultants, they appear to have been written by an inner city resident. The evaluation of minor and negligible effects on the views of walkers through Ickenham Park, Marsh and the fields alongside the A437 from Mickenham are quite frankly incredible. This proposal would re replace open green vistas with a wall of tower blocks. The commentary suggests that their landscape um, building, ha sorry, that their gateway building as a landmark would be strong, improving the character and providing a positive backdrop. This contradicts residents' perceptions. We see it as unsympathetic, imposing, incongruous, overbearing, and a monstrosity. I'm quoting from letters that have been sent in to you. I would like to repeat Ofra's comment from last year. A gateway to Hillingdon should complement and link the existing communities of Hillingdon East's garden estate. I'm going to have to wrap you up now, I'm afraid. Sorry, and Ickenham's ancient village and not divide can, and overshadow them with an inner city there, tower please, block. That's it, your, thank you very much for your time. Sorry, sorry the, the clock beat you there, but, uh, but hey. Okay, right, I'm going to open that up now for members of the committee to ask the petitioners uh, any questions. Councillor? No? Councillor Morse, did you have a question? I do question? have one question. Um, I noticed that we were on page 77. We talk about congestion is now so heavy in the media around here that the reason we're arguing that public health and quality of life is it should be postponed until it is, as if it's just. Now, I've not seen this suggestion is this before. Is this a question to the petitioners, Councillor? Well, what I want to know is is, is this a development of a new policy or. It's not, it's I'm, not sure, a ground I'm sure the petitioners won't be able to answer that question. But uh, is this a question to the petitioners? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I forgot you're still there. You can't answer the question. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> Nearly got technical with you there. So. Um, okay, any other questions for our petitioners this evening? No? Okay, thank you very much. You may return to your seats. Thank you for your time. Okay, we have uh, the applicant who has uh, the opportunity to, to present to the committee this evening. So we have, is it Sarah Hiscott? Thank you, Sarah. The same uh, criteria for yourself as the applicant. So it's five minutes speaking time to the committee. The four minutes will be on green, one minute on amber. And as you know, I will bring you to a close when we get to red. So uh, if you want to press the red button in the middle, when you do that, your time will start. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. The proposal before you has sought to deliver a master-planned residential-led mixed-use scheme that will positively regenerate this long-term vacant site to deliver substantial public benefits as presented in the submitted application documents and acknowledged in the officer's report to the committee. The proposal seeks to deliver 514 new homes alongside flexible commercial floor, uh, a flexible commercial floor space offer which will serve to anchor the proposal in the local centre and enable a variety of complementary commercial and or community facilities. This detailed planning application is the outcome of over 12 months intensive work by the design team in collaboration with officers and other stakeholders. The community have been engaged via consultation events, face-to-face -face meetings and leaflet drops in the surrounding area. The scheme emerged from a landscape-led master planning process which informed layout, scale, massing, orientation, connections, permeability and movement through the site. The design responds to the constraints of the site by seeking to connect these spaces effectively via green infrastructure provision and sustainable movement through better established connections. The adopted site allocation identifies this brownfield site as a strategic site allocation and sets the context for the residential-led mixed-use regeneration of the site for both housing and appropriate uses to support the local centre. Owing to the site allocation incorporating land outside of the, bound the application boundary, the master planning process has also established a wider plan to demonstrate how the proposal can knit into future proposals on land to the west, known as Site A Hillingdon Circus. Furthermore, provisions have also been made to enable the, council's, uh, the council land to the south of the site to be delivered unimpeded. The master plan approach has therefore resulted in a comprehensive view of how this site allocation can be realised beyond just the site whilst focusing on a landscape-led approach. This approach is further supported by the applicant's acquisition of a parcel of land to the east of the site. Whilst not forming part of this application, the purchase of this land enables free access to and from the land to the east of the site to create a clear connection to the Hillingdon Trail. The proposal will deliver a series of significant benefits which are summarised to include sustainable regeneration of this vacant brownfield allocated site which currently makes no contribution to North Hillingdon Local Centre, creation of a new secure and inclusive residential neighbourhood through the delivery of new residential units comprising an appropriate mix of dwelling types that would provide much needed new homes in this part of the borough, delivery of 182 genuinely affordable new homes achieving 35% compliant delivery on unit and habitable room basis which will make a valuable contribution to the borough's affordable housing requirement and fully accords with planning policy at all levels, provision of a mix of flexible commercial uses that will promote and enhance the vitality and viability of the local centre presenting long-term employment opportunities, the delivery of significant landscaping improvements which will enhance the site and surrounding area, generating environmental improvements whilst also improving connections and pedestrian experience <coughs> to and from the site. Delivery of the scheme uh, will provide 26% net gain in biodiversity in excess of the government's target of 10% and an urban greening factor of 0.4. This significant provision has been achieved in consultation with the London Wildlife Trust and through a nature recovery network. On-site play spaces for children of all ages will exceed the GLA's child play space requirements and delivery of a significant quantum of high-quality open space which will be of a benefit to new and existing residents. Finally, a series of transport and highways related improvements, including significant contributions towards public transport improvements, including local bus services. In summary, the proposed development delivers a significant placemaking piece underpinned by a landscape master a landscape-led master, master plan which utilises the provision of green infrastructure to open up the site and to better provide east-west connections which are pedestrian and cycle-led. The proposal will deliver new homes, including affordable homes, and will complement the function of the existing local centre, offering new services, creating activity and a place for people to visit and enjoy. In closing, we recognise that the Master Brewer is a challenging site uh, which, is, which has a complex and varied planning history. Taking this and the 
taking this, the adapted site allocation, the site sustainable location and the master plan led approach adopted into consideration, it has been concluded that the site can accommodate a more ambitious proposal as presented. In this regard, the proposal presents an informed and justified approach based upon a master plan which seeks to address all of the issues raised. In doing so, the proposal creates a place which isn't just about new buildings, but the environment in which they are placed, opening the site up to integrate into an established and valuable green network. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you very much. I will now ask uh, members of the committee if they have any questions for the applicant or agent. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you tell me what you've done in terms of air quality um, impact assessment mitigation, please? Certainly. So the proposal's been supported by a comprehensive air quality assessment, which has been undertaken to assess the impacts of the development in the immediate environment and the wider environment, and that is based upon an assessment of uh, the associated traf traffic assessment data that's been provided to support the scheme. Um, alongside additional monitoring, which has been discussed with the local planning authority. So that's, that's the assessment. In, in, in relation to mitigation, um, the proposal identifies that based upon the traffic, gener uh, traffic information data provided, um, the proposal would have a neutral impact. Um, however, the applicant has also identified mitigation um, in terms of a um, damages contribution to support the scheme. Okay, thank you, Councillor Duncan. Any other questions for the agent or applicant? Councillor Higgins? <coughs> I think you should be sitting on this chair. That was a very good political answer there. But uh, can you just give me, uh, can we actually sort of like put some meat on the bones of the question that Councillor Duncan asked you? Mm -hmm. um, as, a mem as, as a member, I'm concerned that building houses in an environment right next to the M40, which is one of probably one of the most busiest roads into London, which we know from our air quality report has a red zone further than is it actually affecting the residents that actually live the other side. Um, I, don't, I, don't, so I don't know how you can square this circle. Can you mm -hmm. explain in what, they're all going to have air conditioning units in them or what's going to happen, you know? Certainly. Um, I'd add I'm not the air quality consultant for the scheme, but I'll, I'll try my best to summarise how we've approached this. Um, so in terms of design, the proposal, which you've seen, has a perimeter uh, approach to design, try to utilise design mechanisms to create a, a more positive environment south of, of that boundary along the A40. Um, development along main roads is not uncommon, um, and we seek to use these mechanisms in, in, as a way of alleviating air quality impacts as well as noise impacts. Um, certainly habitable rooms aren't proposed to be positioned along those boundaries, and um, windows, although not sealed, they are openable, but there will be mechanical ventilation provided throughout the development. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, thank you very much. If you can turn your microphone off and then return to your seats. Great. I'm going to put my glasses on for the next bit because we have an email that's come through from um, Ward Councillor, Councillor Chapman for Hillingdon East. So I just thought for the record, read that out. Um, okay, so Chairman and Committee, my apologies that neither of us uh, can attend the Planning Committee tonight due to prior commitments. However, we wish to register our appreciation of the officer's report and support their recommendation that the application is refused. They set out clearly in the report the scale, height, size and density of the proposals are not in character with the local area and would have a very negative impact on the local Greenbelt and surrounding residential areas. Parking provision in the scheme is inadequate and would inevitably have an impact on local streets which do not ha currently have their own parking management schemes uh, and where parking is already an issue. Also, there would be an inevitable increase in vehicle movements if this scheme was completed, which would add to already congested traffic flows with increase both in air, noise, air and noise pollution to the surrounding area. In the proposed properties themselves, there must also be a question marks about the noise and air quality and whether there is acceptable levels of daylight and sunlight. For these reasons and the other points raised in the report, we ask that the committee support the officer's recommendation and refuse the application. So that's uh, from Councillor Alan Chapman from Hillingdon East. So that's uh, all of the uh, petitioners, applicants and ward councillors. It's now really to open it up to members and I think Councillor Morgan, you indicated. So over to you. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, 
I actually fully support the officer's recommendations on this. Um, the last time I was involved on this site was when we had the Tesco's um, uh, uh, um, plans. Um, this looks far worse than the, the Tesco's application. Um, look, <coughs> it's, it's too big, it's too bulky. Um, I'm sorry, the saying it will have a neutral effect on air pollution around Hillingdon Circus. Unless everybody's using electric cars and tubes, then I'm sorry, two cars will have an effect of the pollution in there. So I'm fully in support of the officer's recommendations to refuse this application. Okay, Councillor, I think we've got a couple of indications. Are you moving that, Councillor? I'm happy to move that, okay. yes. All right, well, we've got a couple of uh, councillors indicated, so we'll take their comments and then we'll get a seconder and move on. So, Councillor Higgins? Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, it, it's a no-brainer. Um, I, I, the thing I just want to say is that um, really I can't see the possibility of what can be put on that site to just the location it is. I don't think, you know, I mean, the hotel was probably the best thing that could have happened on there. And actually, I've been in here when we had the IKEA one, which is even further back than that one. So, And that was refused because of the airport. But, you know... Um, there's no brainer here. I, I just think developers are going to have to think. But I, I, this is one brownfield site. I can't see residential properties being put on it. Um, also, residents have to be aware that something will go on there. Um, it might not be, you know, it can never be, you know, it's a brownfield site. So, yeah, on that, I, I, I'll, I'll let Councillor Melvin second it, but that's all I really have to say on it. Well, I think we've got Councillor Duncan that's indicated. Thank you, Chair. Yes, fully support um, the officer's report and the reasons for refusal. Um, I, too, can remember previous uh, committee debates on this site. Um, one thing I'm very, very pleased to see is um, refusal reason five about air quality. Uh, people who know me on planning committees know that I will not, as a matter of principle, vote for housing in areas of poor air quality because we are condemning those residents, as well as existing residents round about, um, to breathe air that is damaging to them. And I, I think if we all refused to do that, something would happen. It would have to happen. And um, I did ask the, um, the agents about this. And can I say that... Um, to say that there's a Section 106 agreement that £294,522 would have to be paid to deliver an air quality local action plan, it's not about money. It's about people would still be breathing this dreadful air. We must do something. Thankfully, the climate change... Um, uh, motion that we all approved hopefully will start to put more flesh on the bones and also give guidance to developers on this very important issue I feel. Um, I do have sympathy uh, We uh, in the um, local plan part 2 um, I did appear at that at the examination every day and I did argue as did others um, and there was a lady from Ickenham Residents Association, as it so happened, who, who was also there, arguing that these huge increases in densities that have been imposed on Hillingdon are really very much out of character with the borough. And to increase suburban areas and make them urban is totally unrealistic. We're at the edge of London, and our policies should reflect that. So I do think this is very large. It will uh, be seen uh, from the green belt and destroy the openness of those views that people currently enjoy. And I do think it will provide a living environment where the air quality, I am not at all confident, will be good for anybody to breathe in that area. So very happy to support officers' recommendations. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Duncan. Councillor Morse, you indicated... I just reiterate Councillor Duncan's point. We take the view that compensation for air quality is not a good path. I mean, we don't actually take the view it works because for the reasons she said, and I think that we should underline that from our side. That's our view. Okay, thank you. 
Right, we have uh, Councillor Morse has moved. I think Cat Cam Councillor Morgan. Morgan. <laughs> it's been a long night already. Another meeting to go yet. Uh, Councillor Morgan has moved. Councillor Melvin has seconded. So we are in a place where we can take a vote. So all those in favour of officer's recommendation. That's unanimous. So that application is refused. So as, as mentioned at the start of the meeting, we're going to skip item 8 now and uh, defer that to the end of the meeting so I can leave. We're going to go to item 9, and 9 and 10 I believe. Okay, so just to remind members, um, James Roger has declared an interest on these next two items, so he has left the room, so he's going to leave us in the capable hands of uh, Mandip and Alan. Thank Over you, you, Chair. Um, items 9 and 10 on the agenda both relate to the proposed improvements to Cranford Park with an application for full planning permission and a parallel application for listed building consent. Bless you. We will only be doing one presentation um, and the Chair will lead on two separate votes, one for planning permission and one for the list of building consent. The application proposes works within Cranford Park, which is um, a greenbelt site. You will notice that there's lots of red shading and that's because there are some um, statutory listed buildings within uh, Cranford Park. The works are proposed to assist with regeneration of, new, of the new facilities and to restore the park's historic core. It's proposed to create a new cafe with associated kitchen above the Grade 2 um, listed cellars of the former Cranford House. Access and refurbishment of the cellars is proposed for use linked to the new cafe and also a part change of use for a small quantum of museum or exhibition space. So a D use but precluding some of those more in, um, intensive uses such as places of worship and um, let's say a public hall. If we take you through the plan, so this is the application site, Cranford Park obviously straddles north and south of the M4 motorway, um, and the location um, of the existing facilities is outlined in red. Sorry, the plans are slightly unclear, but we have some very useful vi um, visuals at the end. So this is the existing basement plan, the existing ground floor, the existing first and roof plans. We then go on to the existing site plan. So the you can see some of the um, <coughs> parking areas. We have an existing visitor centre, the proposal plan, so you'll see there's some minor alterations which comprise of the listed building consent works. We have the existing visitor centre elevations and the existing north and south elevations for the statutory listed buildings. We have the proposed ground floor um, plan with a cellar. Now this straddles, this says one of two, so I'm hoping two of two is later in the plan. This shows the general arrangement plan, and this is the two of two plan for the listed building works for the cellar um, proposals. I have proposed pavilion works, and this is just the sections through the site. If I take you through to some of the visuals, so these have been prepared just to give us an idea of the, um, the kiosk plans, proposed stables, works um, in the context of the locally listed building take you through so you can see the quantum of space that's proposed. Take you through the application site, so that's the existing car park, um, landscaping which will, is proposed to be thinned as part of the works and this is the boundary of the car park area. The forecourt for the cellars and the cafe site and the retained stable buildings. The retained stable buildings. So this is to be retained for public viewing. Part of the proposals is to provide some form of exhibition space and this is um, part and parcel of the visitor experience to encourage more people to come to um, Cranford Park and view the facilities. Again, this is another area that's retained for public viewing. These are the stable building lower floor plans for structural works and refurbishment. So this will be the list of building consent works on the upper floor which is also proposed to be refurbished and the existing visitor kiosk. 
take you to a nicer photo, maybe. <laughs> there you go. Um, repairs to the existing Grade 2 listed um, stable <coughs> block building are proposed with the first floors converted to commercial use. The existing kiosk building is proposed to be adapted for additional public toilets and further works are proposed that include an extension to the existing car park, enhanced landscaping works and improvements of access circulation and restoration of historic landscape features. The entire application site is within the green belt. We have set this out in full in the um, officer report under agenda item 9. So the new cafe building is deemed to be inappropriate development within the green belt. It does not fall within any of the exceptions. As inappropriate development, it requires very special circumstances. Uh, the Grade 2 listed sellers are on the Historic England's Heritage at Risk Register, and although multiple options have been investigated about how we can remove, uh, fund the works to restore the, the sellers and save the sellers, um, it's not been found, and this is one mechanism that has been found in order to ensure that we get sufficient funding to take to restore the facility and also to take the building off the Heritage at Risk Register. These do comprise the very special circumstances that we consider are necessary to outweigh the harm or limit the harm to the potential um, Greenbelt environment. The proposed works are considered to provide a significant level of regeneration to the park and restore and protect listed structures and improve the character of the immediate locality. It's also envisaged that this would be a much more visited park um, in time to come because of the amount of regeneration taking place in um, Hayes Town Centre. This is its primary location um, or its, its main outdoor amenity area. So providing improvements will also encourage its greater use. The applications for planning permission and listed building consent, so agenda items 9 and 10, are accordingly recommended for approval. Thank you, Mandip. Councillor, uh, no petition uh, hearings on this one, so uh, straight into members' comments. Uh, Councillor Higgins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I will uh, uh, support officer recommendation and put myself forward to saying that for both items. I also think it's absolutely wonderful that we are, as a council, we've done such fantastic work in Ryslip around the moat and that building. So this would be an, another absolute, once it's restored, be a gem in Hillingdon's uh, thing, and I think it will be visited far more than the other sites that we have in Hillingdon because it is an absolutely magnificent site. Um, so I'm actually thrilled with this, and I think it's uh, although the toilet, you know, if you're going to that kiosk at the moment needs to be knocked down and make it more in keeping, I think it's just absolutely horrible. But uh, apart from that, I will go with officer's recommendations. Thank you. Yes, I, I'd like to second um, that. I'm very pleased to see this. I know that there's a lot of work that's gone into this. It is a very valuable site. It's a shame that we lost the mansion some time ago, but at least we're saving what's there. The grounds are lovely and have the opportunity to be a really um, beautiful place for people to visit. So very happy to second. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Councillor Morse, you indicated. Okay. Uh, I would like to just say that I think the uh, residents of Pinkwell are extremely happy this is taking place because we take the view that down there this park is an underused asset and obviously it's on the danger list and at certain elements of it in the underground so we, we totally approve of this of this development. Yeah. Councillor Morgan. Thank you very much Mr Chairman. Yes I'm also in favour of this, uh, both applications. Um, it is a lovely area and if you've never been there go there um, I was there fortunately enough when they started doing the excavations for the cellars yeah, um, and unfortunately we weren't able to go down it was too dangerous I think they were more interested about damage to the chain than the mayor getting <laughs> yeah. banging his head um, <laughs> but no I'm fully in favour of this and uh, yes um, I know we're building, yet again, special circumstances on the green belt, but this is special. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we've got two items to vote on, uh, 9 and 10, so I think, Councillor Higgins, you moved item 9, or both. Councillor Duncan? I second both. Okay, so let's take a vote on agenda item 9 that have both been... So that's unanimous. I'll let you put your hands down so you can put them up again, and then... 
Agenda item 10, please, can I have a vote on that? So that's unanimous as well. So both agenda items 9 and 10 are approved. Okay, right, that means that we move swiftly on to agenda item 11, which is Bridge House, Waterside House, Oxford Road, Uxbridge. Now, some time ago, we received an application for prior approval for the conversion of the whole of the former Xerox site. So that's Bridge House, Riverview House, Waterside House, so all of the sites outlined in the plan in red. We were left with our hands tied behind our back, I think, is the way that we, we normally characterise prior approval, and we, were, we had to allow for the conversion of these buildings to um, residential. Now, the mix that we had approved under the original scheme was, um, was poor. It was predominantly studios and one beds. The applicants came back to us last year and with a proposal to amend their scheme to provide more two-bedroom units. Now, although we're not in favour of prior approvals and we have an Article 4 in place on this site, we have a precedent uh, or we have a extant consent that they can implement with a poor mix of development, so getting an enhanced mix um, through a variation was seen to be favourable. In the time that it's taken, that, so this committee um, ratified um, the recommendation to approve that changed mix in August. Late last year, we had a High Court decision which says that you can't change decisions in this way. So we have come full circle. You will see a few of these in the next few months whereby we have to report them back to you again because the description of development has now changed. The recommendation remains unchanged and the scheme remains unchanged. However, procedurally, the paperwork would not have been worth the paper it's written on had we not brought it back to Planning to Committee for recommendation for approval. So the report effectively is the same as the one you approved in August, but this is, I don't want to say administrative or paperwork, but we, we're recommending approval again. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Higgins, you indicated. Yeah, I, I mean, we've really got no choice. It's like having your hands tied behind the back and then someone coming around slapping you on the face. Um, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'll go with officer's recommendation. I'm happy to take it. Is that seconded, Councillor Melvin? Okay. So, we've got Councillor Goddard wants to uh, chip in. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr Chairman, thank you. I, I must express frustration with the fact that we are just stuck with these prior approvals. You know, it, uh, it does seem to me that... Uh, you know the change in mix in the scheme it's greater density you know we, we have no choice but to accept it so I, I again agree with it but uh, it, it is a frustration okay. All right. thank you very much for your comments any other comments from anyone so we have we have a proposer we have a seconder so a show of hands please so that's unanimous so that's agenda item 11 approved Okay, agenda item 12. Thank you. Agenda item 12 is an application site on Chippendale Way, so most of you will remember this. Yes, it's been here a few times. So the application site, if, uh, if we <coughs> orientate ourselves, the land to the south, East is the RAF Uxbridge site, and then this is the into the back of the into car park. So this is Chippendale Way leading up to the, the larger Sainsbury's um, that serves Uxbridge Town Centre. So the application site here has had a significant planning history. It was approved for 12 flats in 2011. That was then amended to a scheme for four units. Um, in 2018. We are now back to the beginning of 2011 and we have a scheme for 12 residential units on the site. The application is proposed to be car free. We are in Uxbridge Town Centre so we are proposing just disabled car parking on the site and that's controlled by condition to ensure that the family unit and then the affordable units are prioritised in having the limited parking spaces that are provided on site. I take you through the application plan. So the yellow denotes um, the extent of the town centre. Sorry, the blue denotes the town centre area. So we are just on the out on the outer edge of the designated town centre. If we take you through the application um, proposal, so this is the site layout and location plan. 
I think we have a, no we don't have a more detailed ground floor plan, sorry. So we do have some buffer provided along the ground floor, so we're trying to keep um, a building line which is roughly in accordance with the uh, properties to the north of this site. There is communal amenity space provided to the rear and bin storage, having consulted um, internally, is proposed by a Chippendale Way but stored internally at the rear of the application site. These are the floor plans. So we are proposing a mix of <coughs> seven one bedrooms, four two bedrooms, and one three bedroom unit. Now, in a town centre location, uh, we the London plan does, to some extent, allow for the provision of a greater mix of one and two bedroom units. However, there is a pressing need in the borough for three bedroom units. Therefore, we um, we have managed to secure one on the application site. The principle of development has been established through the various planning permissions in 2018 and 2011. If I take you through to the elevation drawings, the elevations are different to the 2018 permission, but they were for four houses. Uh, so if I take you through the way in which we have tried to articulate that the built form does not over-dominate the residential housing which is located here. On the other side of the application site, so that would be to the right, um, it would be the nursery site at the, which is um, still functional as a nursery at the moment. We, it is proposed um, to be of a scale which is not dissimilar. I think there are some plans here. We take you through, I don't know if you can see this red dotted line, but that was the consented scheme. So we, we are going higher and we're not saying we're not going higher through this application. <coughs> However, when you compare it to its neighbour, which is the Into Car Park, um, it is in keeping with its surroundings, albeit not the surroundings <laughs> of its immediate residential property. The, the character is so varied that the site can take a traditional design or the more modern design that has been put forward. The application has, is also providing um, a contribution for off-site affordable housing, primarily because the viability to provide it on-site is limited. And also, if we were to secure one unit, there is a concern that a registered provider would not want to take one unit um, because of the, the management costs. So one unit was the output from the viability appraisal. Um, the application has been recommended for approval, and I'll just show you some of the site plans. So I've obviously referred to the Into Car Park, so that's across the road from the application site, and that's the development site with the nursery over to the right-hand side, and the traditional residential properties on the left of the application site. Thank you. Thank you, Mandip. Okay, another one, no petition, so it's open to members for comments. Councillor Higgins, you indicated? Yeah, um, it's very grey, isn't it? So I hope that's just the artistic impression or it was just a very cloudy day. Um, the only thing I think which I didn't see on the drawings was the storage for bicycles. Um, I'm, I know it's there because it's in the report, but I can't see where it would be. Is this little portal here with the parking? Okay, fine. Okay, that's Sorry. that's brilliant. I mean, I, I mean, what can you say about it? Boring, dull, and uh, um, yes, but I'll go with officer's recommendation on this one. I think you just wanted to clarify where the cycle is. Yes, I just for, um, I, I made a slight error that I was corrected uh, much earlier in the meeting by Councillor Higgins. The cycles are actually in the bottom right hand corner. Is that by the dustbin? Uh, yeah, so Sorry. The, it's the grey rectangle, that's it, Sorry. just there is, oh. is where the cycles are. So that's uh, parking, car parking. That, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. You do need good eyesight for some of these plans. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so any other comments, Councillor? Councillor Duncan. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, yeah, it's been crammed in a bit, and I do think that this southern um, point of the development is very close to the boundary, and the setback is not sufficient really, because these houses are very close to the road anyway. But I, what I wanted to ask is. Is it just four parking spaces at the rear of the amenity space? And they're going to be disabled, are they? So the development is required to provide 10% accessible units, and we would then secure 10% accessible bays as first preference, with one of the other spaces going to the family unit within the development. 
so that we're accommodating for what we feel is the most need, the families and then those with disabled um, units so, on the site. So how many would be disabled one, did you say? If 10%, yes, it would be so one be unit one. and one so the other three. It, 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 the, the, the condition seven is the relevant one, and it's not actually clear, if I'm honest with you, the split. So members, wait, if members have a particular view on this, whether it should be one or two spaces, it might be sensible that we correctly condition it now. I, yeah, I, I would prefer it if it could be two. It, I, I mean, because yeah. uh, people the with disabilities, they so can't walk far the yeah, very I, often I, I, anyway. I, I'd be quite happy to recommend the, the And then one could be D for the three-bed unit two. and one for yeah. another yeah. unit. I think it would be better if it's yeah. two. Um, well, we yeah. have a management transfer. So I think Councillor Morphe indicated... Uh, yeah, I would just say, uh, amazingly, very thoroughly examined by panel officers, it just squeezes inside a number yeah. of our rules yeah. by the tightest of margins. I can't see any other reason than to support it. Councillor Morgan? Yeah, again, it does seem to be, let's squeeze this one in. Um, it's just a shame that the height um, swamps uh, its neighbours, number 23 and 24. Um, but, you know, I suppose I'll then turn around and say, well, you know, directly opposite us, of course, uh, a dual carriageway is the, the car park. So, you know, we're, we're scuppered there. Um, but so, we, yes, reluctantly, I'll go with the officer's so we'll recommendation. You're moving that, are you, yeah. Councillor? Okay. okay. Councillor Higgins? <coughs> yeah. yeah, I've already moved it, but uh, I just wanted to, for future reference, when we're looking at these schemes with, with disabled access, some disabled people need... Um, scooters and stuff, and maybe we should think about some way of storing those as well on sites in the future. That's just uh, yeah. okay. something that's okay. okay. To move this one forward and to clarify, um, Councillor Higgins, you moved. I take oh, Councillor Moore, your second, but we've also got an, a, an, a, an adjustment to the condition. To the condition. So we're, that's what we're voting on. So uh, we've got a mover and a seconder. All those in favour? That's unanimous. So that uh, scheme is approved. Okay, swiftly on, because we've got North planning waiting outside patiently. Yeah. Um, Shall we just read the plans? So we just move, uh, move through the plans and then obviously we'll uh, try and get these concluded. Um, but there might be some points that members want to pick up. So um, if I can just make the key point here is there's a sort of built footprint around the, the bunker and this isn't this isn't expanding it outwards it's just uh, making more efficient use of it so it, it, it's uh, I think that's one of the key points the report's trying to get across thank you chair in addition to providing the additional car parking on, in this application there are significant landscaping enhancements through surface rainwater gardens so it's not it's biodiversity, ecological enhancements and drainage improvements as well as providing additional visitor parking. It is in the Greenbelt but it does meet the Greenbelt exception um, tests. And I'll take you through some of the plans. So when we're talking about encroachment into the Greenbelt it is otherwise manicured lawn um, that we're eating into um, and hopefully the rainwater gardens will provide enhancements. The application is recommended for approval. Okay, thank you. Councillor Higgins? Yeah, I'll go with the recommendation. I mean, it just shows that you get the asset right in a council of saying that visitors want to come to and we have to accommodate more people to park so mm. it's just it means it's a success so that's a, a good thing for us and uh, yeah I will move that off this mm -hmm. Councillor Duncan can I just ask what the access arrangements are for people with disabilities or is there any any well, the, 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 in connection the, with this that. increases it to five blue badge and five brown badge, but um, I, I'm glad to say in this report, condition, the condition <laughs> sets out in great detail. We, we've even got motorcycle spaces. It, so it, we, it, we the are, report ha, has it all. So we are detailing that. Thank you. Yeah, it's Thank all you. here. Okay, Councillor Higgins has moved. Councillor Haggard has second, so can I have a show of hands, please? That's unanimously approved, so agenda item 13 is approved. So let's move on to 14 now, and I think possibly be quite speedy on this one. Agenda item 14 has been to planning committee before, so it was the application uh, for a hotel extension on Stockley Park. Um, 
the reason this application is before us is because substations up until a while ago were able to be located below ground. I believe the law or the rules have changed and they now need to be above ground. So the substations are now proposed to be provided in the location of car parking bays and the car parking has been reallocated to other locations. Um, there is no net loss of parking and then there is no net loss of disabled parking and the application is recommended for approval. Okay, thank you, Mandip. Councillor Goddard, you just, just beat Councillor Morgan there. <laughs> thank you, Mr Chairman. I move approval. Okay. I'll second. And Councillor Morgan seconding. So can I have a show of hands for that, please? Sorry, Councillor Higgins. Um, this is the most stupid thing ever, putting these up and just cluttering more of our uh, space outside. I, I just don't understand it. That's all I'm going to say. I mean, I'll, I'll agree with it, but I just wanted to make that on the record. Thank you. Okay. So just for completeness, I can I have a show of hands for that? So, uh, yep. So thank you very much. That item is approved. So the penultimate item, because we've still got item 8 to go back to, um, is agenda item 15, which is the Uxbridge Watery and Kingston Lane. Thank you. The, uh, the Uxbridge Mortuary application seeks permission to erect two single-storey side and rear extensions in order to increase the capacity of the mortuary facility. So the mortuary is located to the south of the existing Uxbridge Cemetery. Um, the application site is wholly within the green belt. However, under, the, under paragraph 1.45 part B, the application is actually deemed to be an appropriate development within the green belt because of its um, use for, for burial and purposes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if I take you through the proposals, I did try and do a before and after to make life a little bit easier. So if we look at the, <laughs> the existing application site is, is here, and so the white denotes the extent of built form. Um, obviously under green belt test it should be fairly nominal um, increases, but we do have quite a lot of um, additional floor area on the application site. So we're protruding over to the sides and over here to the rear. We are securing additional tree planting in order to mitigate some of the loss and there is additional hard surface but that's to allow sufficient maneuverability for, um, for vehicles on the site. The application has been recommended for approval. Um, I'm happy to take questions. There's a bit of clarification I feel it's important to give. So on the tree loss, the council's landscape architect wanted to take a quite strong line regarding the five trees and have 15 trees replace them. So that's, a, that's a, quite an uplift. Uh, uh, so effectively, uh, we're supporting our, the landscape officer as the, pla as the planning team. Uh, the applicant, and obviously you know who the applicant is, owns surrounding land. So even if they can't get 15 trees on this site, the, the, as they own surrounding land, there'll be opportunities for tree planting. But the condition basically requires 15 trees to be planted to replace five. Uh, okay. Councillor Higgins, you indicate. Yeah, I welcome that. And uh, just can we make sure that officers make sure that these trees are good for getting rid of carbon dioxide, I think is the, the word. Uh, I think I'll beat the punch to Councillor Duncan on that one. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and I'd like to go agree with officers' recommendations. Okay, can I have a seconder for that, please? Yeah. Councillor Duncan, you're happy to second that. Any? Let's have a show of hands then. Okay, that item is approved. Have a good evening, uh, <laughs> Councillor Chairman. <laughs> Can I please get a nomination for acting chairman for this item? Please can I get a seconder? Okay. Can we 
Is it unanimously you you agreed? All yeah, yeah, all, yeah, all in favour. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I will go to. I, so I, I realised I didn't get any support because you remember last time I was a chairman how bad I was. Oh, but yeah. no, I kept you in place all the time. Um, anyway, we go to agenda item eight. Um, uh, Bourne Court site, uh, Bourne Court, Ricelip. Over to you, Mendy. Thank you. This is a deed of variation application. The ones that we normally refer to as administrative, but this is a bit more than administration. So the applicants. Um, received planning permission for the redevelopment of the Bourne Court site for 87 residential units. At the time, they were providing an off-site in-lieu contribution towards affordable housing, and that was for us to deliver affordable housing on our own assets elsewhere. However, um, they have now been approached to provide 100% affordable housing on the site, and that would be split between Blocks A and Blocks B to provide 54 shared ownership units in Block A and 33 affordable rented units in Block B. The application is supported and recommended for approval um, for the delivery of 100% affordable housing. Thank you. Anyone want to take me out? Councillor Duncan. Yes, well, um, it's, it's the same development, just different tenure. There is a big need for um, affordable rented accommodation, as we know, so very happy to... Uh, Go with officer's recommendation. And I have a seconder. No. Councillor Morgan. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? No. no? Fine. Thank you. So can I have a show of hands, please? Oh, well, I'm not allowed to do that anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. And I call, call the meeting to close. Thank you.